Aloha. And today I got to say to everybody, ni hao, because we are very excited to bring you another episode of China, Hawaii, and you. I'm your host, Andrew Zimmerman, and I'm really, really excited for today's episode. We're going to be doing things a little bit differently, though. In the past, we've been talking about a lot of politics stuff, and a lot of people have a lot of concerns with the Evergrande crisis and how China is interacting with the Taliban and uh, the riots in the situ uh, in Hong Kong. But today, I think we're going to go with sort of a less of a political angle. And we're going to talk about Chinese as a language, which has also really fascinated with me for a long, long long time. And so today, first, I want to introduce our guest, Jacob Truman. Um, Jacob is a uh, former missionary with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, he served in Canada in a fairly heavy Chinese-speaking area, and we're going to talk to him about his experiences in, in Mandarin. So both of us do not look like we speak Mandarin, but at the end, we're hoping to we're hoping to prove that we actually know what we're talking about. So, Jacob, do you want to give yourself a little bit of an introduction, say anything that I missed? Yeah, yeah. My name is Jacob Truman. Um, I was born in Utah, and my family lives here now, and I'm here studying for school. Um, and I just want to first say out that my what I say, my opinion, doesn't reflect any at all in the views of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm just a member of the church, and I don't have any say or anything what they believe this is just my personal opinion so take everything i say with a grain of salt <laughs> yeah 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 well don't worry we're not really here to talk about theology too much um because uh you know the big thing that i'm really interested in is um the mt uh i believe it's called the M uh, mtc program the missionary mm -hmm. training the missionary training center where from my understanding you get something to the effect of nine is it like nine weeks of language training and then they just throw you onto a plane yeah pretty much so um yeah I, we spent nine weeks in a pretty intensive language learning environment we'd be in class for six hours a day and then we have like an hour of language day where we'd be able to learn it by ourselves um and then yeah after nine weeks of training they sent us off to canada and then we were so i was specifically in british columbia and so I was in Vancouver for the most of my time and in a suburb of Vancouver called Richmond. And there there's a in Richmond, there is about like 52% are from China of the population there in Richmond. So it's a really high population. So we got to use it all the time. And as missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ, we're paired, we're always put, put in pairs. And so for my first like three months, I was paired with a native speaker. Um, so someone from Taiwan for about three months, then someone from Hong Kong for about a month and a half. And then from that point on, it was I was just by myself with another white guy, and we were just speaking Chinese in Canada. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I gotta say, I did a lot of reading into um, the intensive uh, programs that they they put you through, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, no matter how intensive uh, the what what they're going to be putting you through, nine weeks is still nine weeks, right? And subjectively. Like I, I know for sure that if I had to like start the start over from like some a language that I don't speak, for example, Korean, I cannot imagine being anything, anything even resembling competent or useful or barely even comprehensible, much less trying to tell somebody about a church. Did you ever have that kind of feeling of like, you know, I am useless here? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> so the first, I'd say the first. For, so the whole focus of the MTC and our that focus of nine weeks is to be able to create in the language and to be able to make basic sentences and to teach basic principles about our church. That was the whole entire focus, like getting to know how to meet someone, how to say a prayer, how to share your testimony about a principle, and maybe share a scripture, maybe. And that was kind of their goal, is basically give you the bare bones, the bare necessities, and help you to be able to just understand the basics of the language, like pinyin, like how to pronounce it tones, just the bare basics. They didn't even touch characters, didn't even worry about that. Just focus on speaking and creating a language. And then when we got there, the first, my first four and a half months when I was with that native speaker, I was kind of the supporting role <laughs> because I was, <laughs> I was just trying to do my best to, to share. And he would like, we would practice a lot right before. For example, if we were about to teach someone about the nature of God, uh, we would practice it like three times before we go into that lesson and share that with someone. Mm. And so he kind of prepped me for it. Mm -hmm. So what was so I have um uh, some family members that are uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I have like some friend uh, family friends. Um, my aunt served in Chile 
And uh, my friend's family, I know he has a sister that served in Los Angeles and they did Spanish. And so I'm sure that there's like, uh, you know, people get Spanish, people get maybe Portuguese or something. What was your reaction to getting that letter in the mail that said like, hey, you're going to be learning Mandarin when you probably didn't really have any experience with it at all beforehand? Yeah, I was... I was a little surprised. I was like, why Canada of all the places, you know? But <laughs> Why Chinese just, of all languages? Right? I honestly had no idea. Like, I took a little bit in high school, but I literally learned nothing in that class. I just kind of knew ni hao and ni tong, where are you from? You know, the basics, the, ba- the two basic phrases is all I knew. Yeah. And then I went, in, I went in basically blind and I had no idea what was going to happen. And I was just shocked, but I was super excited. I... My only, I really wanted to learn a language and I couldn't have asked for a better one. So, yeah, no, subjectively, I, um, I, I think that chasing Mandarin in particular is such a uniquely awesome challenge because um, I just I'm imagining myself if I was, you know, going through the missionary program and I understand like, you know, this is the, the two years is not really necessarily supposed to be about you. Uh, it's, you know, it's supposed to sort of be about furthering the work of the church. But at the same time, I got to admit, um, if I got the letter saying that you're going to be picking up Urdu or, you know, something that you're extremely unlikely to use within the domestic United States, I got to say, I'd probably be a little disappointed. So I think you probably feel like you made it out pretty good, then, don't you? Oh, yeah, definitely. I feel I lucked out. <laughs> I've got the best of the deal I could, I think. <laughs> yeah. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Mandarin as a language design. Um, what are some of the things that you think make Mandarin uniquely challenging? And um, what are maybe some of the things that people think are really hard that you think maybe actually aren't as, as difficult as they might seem? Yeah, I think definitely the hardest part right out of the gate is characters, is that that's a whole aspect of the language that is, it's, it seems like an insurmountable feat, like the, the idea that a word is a character and that there's as many characters. Several that, characters um, as a word. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and so I think that's definitely the hardest part um and definitely writing writing out those characters because there's like a stroke order how you write them i would say that would be the hardest part um but i think one of the, one of the things that kind of scares people that it actually is actually really nice is the grammar and the pronunciation the grammar is very simple and the pronunciation it really just dumbs down english and it's just really simple pronunciation like in english you make thousands and thousands of different sounds and combinations all the times but chinese they're very limited and so you only have to learn like one or two new. I actually know the exact number. Do you know how many there are like in terms of uh, syllables ending, ending a given Kenyan pronunciation? So it's like 16. 16. Yeah. Yeah. There's exact, yeah so, so that would, so like nong, O-N-G, maybe mm-hmm. may, um, that, that would be one, but you can also have tong. So nong mm-hmm. and tong would be one, one common pronunciation. And then mm-hmm. another would be like, um, uh, cha or ba with the a with the a ending that's another one and so there's only 16 of of these right um and so it's insane to me how much information people are able to fit with seemingly a quite limited pronunciation system yeah yeah and so that's that's why i have characters there's so many homophones (laughs) and so oh my gosh yeah um in fact one of the things that i think is most interesting about chinese is um very often you will have characters that share the same pronunciation. In fact, there's a really famous poem. I encourage everybody to look it up. It's something to the effect of um, a lion eating poet or something like that, right? You know what I'm talking about, I can tell. Um, But the the, the premise (laughs) of this poem is it tells a a story about a poet and some lions. Um, But if you had somebody read the it's 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 compre- it's a comprehensible poem, but if you had somebody read it out loud, it would just be something like sure 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 sure. It it would be it would sound completely nonsensical. Um, so I think that's one of the big challenges people have is sort of making that mental acceptance of like okay, sometimes things will have the same pronunciation, and I'm gonna just have to remember it. There's really no other way around it. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I wanted to bring up is um, one of the things that I I think doesn't get talked about enough is um, Chinese doesn't, it's true that there are some things that Chinese doesn't make easier for you, right? So for example, if I'm uh, speaking, if I'm a native Spanish speaker, 
and I'm trying to learn the word president, I already have presidente, right? So I, I can I can probably tie these over pretty quickly, right? Chinese does not do that work for you, okay? Chinese, you got to know zong tong, and um, the you can't even guess how that's spelled or how that's written, right? It's either you know it or you don't, and I think that does provide unique challenge in the sphere in the sphere of Mandarin. But there are uniquely thing things about Chinese that actually I think speed up the learning process and make it even easier. Do you want to talk about some of the ways that Chinese uh, is in some in some respects easier than English? Because um, I have definitely a lot of opinions on that, but I want you to go first. What are some ways that Chinese is easier than English? Yeah, definitely. I think kind of like we mentioned earlier the pronunciation just because it's so straightforward and so simple. And that the grammar pattern, really the basic grammar pattern is our grammar pattern in English. Mm -hmm. And when, so right now I work as at the MTC program. And so I teach missionaries Chinese. And I, when I'm teaching them, they're trying to help them understand the grammar. I'm like, just imagine you're a caveman and you're talking caveman speak. You don't need your thes, you don't need your twos. You don't need tenses. You don't need, you know, it's, it's really just really simple grammar. And sometimes it's hard for them because they want to add like, how do you say like the in Chinese? And you're like, well, it doesn't really exist. And they're like, what? So it sounds wrong in their head when they're translating it, but in all reality, in Mandarin, it's completely correct. Mm, yeah. Um, so I, I joke with people that um, basic Mandarin is, so when you have poor Mandarin, um, that's when you try to use like, find out the, word, the translation for like, uh, so an indefinite article, right? Basic Mandarin, is when you're trying to figure out what the indefinite article is for a, uh, and then you and then intermediate Mandarin uh, is when you find out that that word doesn't exist. Okay, and you just say, "ping guo." Extremely high level Mandarin is when you say "nega nega 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 nega," and uh, you like you use the um, the measure word for everything. So you could say "like a ping guo" or "like a like a jiu." Uh, so you actually do have these things, but if you were literally to translate them, instead of saying, I want a apple, you would be saying, it would actually sound like I want one apple. And I think I want one apple is very, very strange for expressing ourselves in English, right? Because it's not, it's not that it's intrinsically weird. It's just, we've never said to like a family member or something. I want one apple, unless it's like maybe at a grocery store or something. But you know, we don't say we don't just say one to use instead of up. When we could, it's just the fact that we don't makes it the the, the change very strange to us. Yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. And then I think one other thing that makes it uh, makes it a lot um, makes it a lot easier is that many in many ways. Um, Chinese is more internally integrated than, than English. So, um, for example, do you um, do you know the word for schizophrenia in Chinese? I don't, but I can imagine it makes sense. <laughs> yes, it does. So it's jing shen fen lie zhang. Uh -huh. um, so jing shen, I'm sure you know, it means like you know your body's energy or your mental energy in your life, and then fen lie is like to separate something, right? And then zheng is um with the with the uh there, there's a there's a there's there's a little I, f I forget the name of the radical um but there's a little part on the outside of it that indicates that this is a type of disease it's the same one it's the same outside that has on being so i think when i first saw that in a tv show i was i immediately got it like i i, I immediately was able to say like okay Got it. That's that's the word. That's the word for schizophrenia, right? But then I noticed if I would ever ask my Chinese friends, "Hey, do you know the English word for jing shen fen lie zheng?" and they they would think about it and they'd say no, and I'd say it's schizophrenia. And then we talk a little bit more for about a minute, and I said, "Hey, remember that word I just taught you? Do you remember what it was?" <laughs> Hundred percent of the time, they forgot. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah, so I do think that there are some ways that Chinese actually does make uh, make speaking for you quite a lot easier, if nothing else, because they internally integrate things really, really, really well. So I highly encourage people, if you've ever thought about making the climb for the Great Wall of Chinese, do it. Um, so we got, we got, I want to ask one more question about the language itself, and then um, we'll go into a little bit maybe about funny stories about 
kind of learning that you did. Um, you said at the very start of this that the hardest part of it is sort of staring down the fact that you're going to have to learn literally thousands of characters, right? Mm -hmm. There's really no way around this. And um, how did you make that happen? Because for me, I, when I was living in China, it was actually significantly easier than I would think it is because literally I couldn't I couldn't look anywhere and not see Chinese, right? There were literally there was literally writing in my own room, right? So I couldn't I couldn't help but learn it and get a pretty quick use to the um, patterns. And then you know before long, I was able to sort of say like, hey, I've never seen this character before, but I recognize this part and this part. So I was able to like combine them really, really efficiently just because I had had that much exposure. So how did you make that climb for picking up thousands of characters without living in China? That's a really good question. Honestly, it was a, it was a process, definitely. I think it started off with, um, I spent most of my, a good chunk of my time serving in a, in a congregation where there were mostly like college students. Um, a lot of like exchange students where they were from China or from Taiwan, from Hong Kong. So we did a lot of texting. Mm. And so that helped a lot. Like texting, they would like, I would type out something weird and they would like correct me. That helped out a ton. Uh, and then it, I got to a point, I tried it like uh, six months after learning. I was like, okay, I'm just going to try it. I turned my phone into Chinese and it was so hard. It was like, I couldn't do anything on my phone. I had no idea what anything meant. Pleco, Pleco is a Chinese dictionary app. That was my, that was my best friend <laughs> all the time. And then I, but I just stuck it out and I just kept trying and just kept leaving it there and leaving my phone in Chinese, and that helped. I'd spend every day reading in characters. I'd read the scriptures. I'd read the Book of Mormon in Chinese. I'd try to, and I'd have the pinyin right next to it, and also the English, and then my dictionary. And honestly, the best way that I learned how to learn characters was really just through texting, texting with native speakers. That was probably the best way that I learned the characters. Yeah, um, I think the, I, I, I'm very much in kind of like, all of the above kind of person when that sort of leads me into my into my next question which is basically what sort of mindset do you think needs to be adopted for successful language learners because i think in especially in modern society we really get inundated by uh, a lot of uh, language programs that say learn this spicy language or any language really in three months um you know you will you buy this program and then you'll you'll be you'll be good to go in 90 days uh i think that modern society really has an affiliate uh maybe an, a fixation i think on on these concepts of like sort of easy fixes mm -hmm. and i think that these sort of mindsets is why every year we feel like we hear about somebody who set a New Year's resolution to learn Spanish or whatever. And, you know, by, by the time February rolls around, it completely withers away. So what do you think are some of the mindset differences that need to be adopted for successful language acquisition, especially if something as hard as Chinese? Definitely. I think you have to clearly identify the why that you're learning the language. I think that is probably super important. Are you doing it just for fun or are you doing it for maybe better career opportunities? Uh, I, I feel like that's really important for me. My why was kind of chosen for me <laughs> because I was to be a missionary to explain more about our church in the Chinese language. And so that one was a pretty easy box to check for me. Um, but then also important to recognize too, it's really humbling to learn a language because you have to be willing to make mistakes and to ask for help. You have to be willing to humble yourself and to, and to say, I don't know how to say this. I need help. I don't understand what you're saying. Can you please explain it? And I think that, that is probably one of the most important steps to language learning, being willing to humble yourself and ask for help and to be willing to recognize that you are going to make mistakes when you speak and not let those embarrassments stop you. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really important to have that sort of sense of, of humility. Um, I think a lot of people, when you talked about the why of why you're doing it, right? I think to be honest with you, when it comes to language learning in the modern day, a lot of people kind of just do it because they want to feel smart or they want to, um you know have sort of just something to add to their resume but they're not necessarily like dedicated to becoming somebody that literally uses this language for the continuation of the rest of their life right mm -hmm. um like you know i tell people uh if I, for me right if i stopped watching chinese dramas on netflix if i stopped reading 
uh, the book, uh, the books that I have, I even have uh, the Bible in Chinese that I've been very much like to, and I'm not even a religious person. And doing those things in perpetuity of the rest of your life, only under those kind of mindset conditions, I think will you be successful as a language learner, to be honest with you. I think anything less isn't really going to cut it. Definitely. It's kind of, it needs a level of commitment, like almost a lifelong commitment to continue it. Yeah. Lifelong con commitment, maybe not even to necessarily learning, because I do think you can reach a level high enough where like uh, it's now not particularly practical to learn new words, but just of continuous usage, right? Mm -hmm. um, you want to think of like every word as continuously degrading in your mind. And every time that you happen to say the word, it's like the word's freshness in your mind has once again been renewed. And I think that itself is really, really valuable. So the next thing we're going to go into is funny stories all right i remember I, I remember i asked you earlier if you had like some kind of a story when it, when it comes to mandarin of, 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 of like a, maybe a failure uh maybe something that happened to you that you thought was really funny maybe a, maybe even a success story maybe something that made you feel really proud do you have anything um that you want to share with the audience um i think i remember i there's a lot of different things i can think of um i remember there's too, there's too many to think of. There's too many embarrassing, embarrassing moments. Uh, but I think one, I think my favorite thing was seeing the people's reactions sometimes. Like it was, it was, it was pretty funny. One time we were on, so in the Richmond, there's like this, there's this public transit system. It's called the SkyTrain. It's kind of like a subway, but it's like on like a bridge. And we would go on there a lot just to meet people. And I was talking with one person in Mandarin um, and we were having a normal conversation. Then after our conversation ended, I overheard these Taiwanese youth. Um, so they apparently hadn't heard us talking like, oh, they're saying, oh, those are those are missionaries. They speak Chinese. They're like they're like super weird. They're like they're like talking trash about us. And then they got off at the next stop. And as they were walking off, because they were talking in Mandarin at the time, I said, you know, it's I was like, see, and goodbye in Chinese. And they're like, oh! and then the, the gate closed and I, and I was whisked away to the next stop. And it was just okay. lots of just fun things like that. We were. Yeah, just things like that. But I think. I think I had, I definitely had embarrassing moments. But I think I blocked them out of my brain, in all honesty. Mm, yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's probably a good idea. Because um, definitely it's difficult for me to remember being the kind of person that doesn't speak Mandarin. Um, but um, I will tell you one particularly funny story. So it was uh, at a massage parlor. I don't know if you know this or not, but in China, people are really, really big on massages. And I've always had like muscle pain in my life. So it was really cool go, being able to go to a place for like, you know, $20 when in Hawaii, I might pay like 90 for an hour massage or something like that. So I would go very often once a week plus. And I found also it was a really good opportunity to practice my Chinese. And one of the things that the ladies would always want to know is if I had a girlfriend uh, every time. I don't. I think it's just something that happens yeah. when you're like a young man in your in your twenties. Like every but every older woman around you wants to know if you have a girlfriend or something like that. And so uh, the, the the masseuse ladies would always ask me if I had a girlfriend, if I was interested in getting married in China. And I remember saying in China in Chinese. Let me see, let me see if I can remember exactly what it was. Now. There's two words for it. Jacob's going to understand this joke a lot faster than most people will, I think. But there's two words. And I was meaning to say, if I get married in China, there will probably be two weddings. That was what I was thinking I was going to say. If I was getting married in China, there will be two weddings, one in America, one in China. So uh, I said to the masseuse lady, uh, now, the two words are hun li and li hun. And the thing is, hun li is the word for wedding. But I did not say the word for wedding. I said li hun, which is the word for divorce. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, if I get married in China, there will probably be two divorces. <laughs> that was, uh, oh God, that was, oh my gosh. I was, I was just horrified when I found out what I had said. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. yeah. They, they just switch up. They, they just switch like that all the time. They have different meanings, and it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, you I, the the key the key there, right? Is you have to um, you have to be live calculating if what you're saying makes sense. Um, 
And the way that I sort of never forgot that again is um, Li Hun, like the Li character, like Li Kai Li, is actually uh, it it or it means like to separate or to leave something, right? And so once I kind of saw that, I had never made that mistake again. But I think even if it didn't have that, I was just so embarrassed that it, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to think about that. Okay, so we should speak a little Mandarin before we get going. Can you do it some? Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, no one do. You need to do some Mandarin, can you do a good friend? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the most important part is that they have a willing heart, willing to do. 不过他们没有渴望的话，就很难做，因为是花两年的时间做，呃，还有没有收入，这是一个你生活的时间的牺牲。嗯，对我呃同意啊，就就是如果你没有那个渴望，没有没个那个执念，没有呃，那我觉得你没办法学习中文，中文很有可能是最难学习的语言一部呃之一。但是我觉得，只要你还是你还是决定下来了，这个语言我肯定要学会了，好好学习。那我觉得总有一天你要讲的流利，就像就像就像我们一样。对对对。但是我也我也觉得，据我所知，作为一个美国人，很有可能学习中文很有可能是浪费时间，因为呃，在在美国一些部分。嗯、um, ，中国人是很少见的，对不对？嗯嗯，呃，看你在什么城市。啊，对对对，看你在什么城市。但是我个人，嗯、我个人居在夏威夷，我们大部分的人就是日本人。嗯嗯嗯，对，在如果你在加州还是纽约，可能会遇到比较多中国人。呃，比如说，我现在是个传教士的老师，对不对？嗯、呃，我有很多传教士，他们都去。呃，洛杉矶、纽约，还有加州的每个地方，还有有一些在在 Maryland， 还有很多不同的地方，可能有一些小中文的组，他们在哪 ？I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you right there because we don't want to go too long on that. But yeah, very 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 nice. Sometimes I gotta do that too. I'm like, God, how do I say Maryland in Chinese? I know, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I only remember my own state, California, New York. That's it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we're right about out of time. Is there anything that you kind of want to um, leave the audience with about uh, some something that you sort of want to say about your church or anything? Maybe like a, some any kind of product that you want to broadcast or anything like that. Yeah, you know, if any of you are interested in, I love just chatting with people and getting to know people. If you're interested to to learn more about church or how I learn Mandarin, feel free to reach out to me or. Any of your any missionaries in your local area? They have it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. They're probably wearing a black name tag. They're in pairs. They would love to chat with you and get to know you. Guaranteed, better. they would love to chat with you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> these are the I, most friendly people on earth. <laughs> All right, yeah, definitely. Um, and then you know, uh, you, people have got your Facebook. I'm sure you don't mind if they like uh, reach out to you on, on a message. Oh, yeah. You shouldn't be that hard to find. Um, but yeah, I think uh, your Chinese is definitely really, really good, and I can tell that you put in. A lot of time for it,、uh, and I know that、uh, you know. Although we, you and I, had really different reasons for studying Chinese, right? I think what I see in you is something that I see in a couple foreigners, actually in China. You know, even there are that many, which is a genuine passion for thinking critically about the language and thinking about what kind of person can become someone that's fluent in Mandarin, and that is something that I really, really admire. So. Thank you very much, Jacob, for coming on.、Uh, thank you very much for everyone for tuning in. We're very, very happy to talk a little bit about this、uh, great wall of Chinese as a language, and、uh, we really, really hope that we can have more people on to talk about why we love this language so much and why we think you can do it too. Mahalo, everybody. <laughs>